Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Today I'm going to be a quick tip on how to apply UVs to your flip fluid simulations and export them to your program of choice for texturing. Let's get started. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly apologize for my absence. It's been a very busy start to the new year for me, but we should have a couple of more videos coming soon, including a full breakdown and tutorial of how to create a Molotov simulation. Let's get into it. There are actually multiple ways of getting UVs onto your flip simulations. I'm just going to be showing you the way that I do it and one variation. This isn't a flip fluid simulation tutorial, so I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of my setup instead of starting from scratch. If we exit to OBJ level here and go into our sphere, which is what spawns in the fluid, all I have is a sphere, a transform node, and all this transform node does is bring the sphere from point A to point B. There's just a couple keyframes on the trans, uh, translate. Um, and then from there, I just go up to particle fluids, emit particle fluid, select my sphere, press enter, and then it will create the rest of these nodes for me. Well, at least the create surface node. We'll get onto the rest node. After that was done, all I did was put down a ground plane after the gravity so that the fluid did not fall through the floor, uh, as it will if you don't have a ground plane, like such. Just fall down forever. And then after that, I just changed a few settings in my flip object and my flip solver. And I'll just go over those now quickly. So in my flip fluid object, I just added a viscosity attribute. And then in my flip solver, I just, in the viscosity tab, I added enable viscosity and then viscosity by attribute. And then I set my viscosity scale here. The reason I set the viscosity by attribute is so that if you wanted to do an attribute randomize or sorry, an attribute noise and have thicker parts and then thinner parts of your fluid, you could do that with the viscosity attribute you've created. I didn't in this case, but it's just a good habit to get into. In the particle motion tab, I also increase my uh, reseeding, which in the case of viscous fluid is really good for getting a lot more volume and makes for a better meshed um, fluid. In this case, it's a really simple simulation, so I didn't need to, but again, it's a good habit to be in. Bear in mind that you don't always need to increase the surface of a sampling, as it will increase, of course, the baking time of your simulation, so be careful with this uh, setting. After that, I didn't really change much else. I just changed my particle separation to a size that would be detailed enough, but quick enough to simulate for the tutorial and then put my viscosity to whatever I felt like was a good amount, and then I cached it. So I came up to OBJ level, to the particle fluid geometry um, object, which was created automatically with the emit from particle fluid, and cached it. And then you will get these nodes by default, none of the other ones. Oh, you'll get this one as well. Now we've gone over that, I can quickly go over how to get the UVs onto your flip simulation. Like I said, there are a couple of ways, but they do revolve around the same thing. So I'm gonna jump into my sphere object, which is uh, the source for my fluid. And just underneath the create surface, which was created for me, I add a rest attribute just here. Just a normal rest node, just plopped in directly under the create surface. What this rest node is gonna do for us is create an attribute. And this rest attribute here is gonna track the initial or rest position of a geometry. This will allow us to do procedural operations on the geometry, such as deforming it, which is exactly what we're gonna do with the UV. So after that, I just leave that completely alone into the outer surface and leave that be. That is one way to create the rest attribute for your fluid. Another way which creates the exact same effect is if you go into your DOP network, flip solver and rest, you can actually add a rest attribute directly in the DOP network. One thing I'll be wary of here is the frames between reset, which is exactly what it sounds like. Each 50 frames by default, the rest will reset, meaning that a new rest will override the last one, meaning that your UV will be constantly changing and updating itself, which you don't want. One way to avoid this is to use the prior method I just showed you, or to just set your frames between rest to the exact frame range of your timeline. So in my case, it will be 70. Oops, 70. Meaning that the only time it will reset is at frame 70, and at that point, the animation will be over entirely anyway. Again, these methods do the exact same thing. I think that the rest node attribute is a little bit tidier, less messy. Just one node, drop it in, and you don't have to think about it. But both work the exact same. Whichever method you chose, once we go back into our particle fluid, and cache our compressed cache here. We can go into our surface preview and we can see our simulation. And here's my slightly viscous fluid simulation here. What we're gonna do with this after is just mesh it. So all of these nodes here is just, are just meshing my fluid simulation, my particles into an actual mesh. The way you do this is up to you. I prefer to use this pipeline, which is a VDB from particles. However, you could just drop down a um, particle fluid surface visualize that and just play with the settings here um, and use the default settings on that. Uh, I don't advise um, for this because it's not the most optimal way to go about it. Um, for something like this, you would probably get a fine result, 
But what tends to happen with the particle fluid surface is you get a lot of holes that disappear and appear and then a lot of jittering and you have to do a lot of smoothing to work it out. So I try to avoid this when I can. So what I like to do here is to drop down a VDB from particles and I like to make sure my voxel size is the exact same as my particle separation in my simulation. So you can just go over here to your uh, flip simulation, go to your flip object and copy that over. You can also, if you're gonna do a lot of changing, do copy parameter uh, on the particle separation. And then we can go back to the particle fluid and then we can do paste as relative references. Meaning that if you change your particle separation in your simulation, this will change accordingly. You don't have to copy and paste and go back and forth between them. And as you can see, my particles have been converted to VDB, which looks a bit like lumpy porridge, but we're gonna work on that. The next thing I'm gonna do is a VDB reshape. And all that I'm doing on the reshape is leaving the default settings, which is the offset on one. And then I have a VDB smooth. Again, uh, not default settings. I believe these are increased a little bit. You can play with these. Uh, I have mine on two and two, but depends on your simulation. In this case, super low detail simulation. It doesn't really make a difference. And then on the end, I have a convert VDB, which just turns my VDB into polygons so that we can actually work on the surface. So after our mesh fluid, we're going to drop down attribute transfer. And this attribute transfer is going to be targeting the rest attribute on points. And the reason we're doing it on points is if you come up to our surface preview, which is where our uh, particles are stored before we mesh them, and we look at the information, we'll see that we have six point attributes and one of them is rest. So that's the one we're going to be targeting because it's on points. So we're going to come down and we're going to type in points. Sorry, we're going to type in rest into the points section. I've just ticked off the rest of these. They're empty anyway, so it doesn't really make a difference, but um, I've just turned them off. And the conditions tab here, we'll come back to in just a moment and you'll see why. So the next thing we're going to do is drop down an attribute wrangle. And I know it sounds scary, but trust me, we're not doing any complex code here. I will explain exactly what we're doing. So what we're going to do is make sure it's running over points, which I believe it is by default. And we're just going to type in V at UV equals at rest and then semicolon to end that line. And I'll explain exactly what this does. So the first part here via UV is simply referring to the vector attribute named UV. So V at UV is the vector attribute UV. That's all we're doing. And then we're saying the vector attribute UV equals at rest. And as you know, the at rest is the data we stored earlier so that we could deform the UVs. So as you can see up here, we've got at rest and we placed the arrest node earlier. So we're just saying vector attribute UV is equal to at rest. And the reason we've got them plugged in like this is because the left uh, socket here is actually geometry to transfer attributes to and the right socket is geometry to transfer attributes from so we're taking the rest attribute from our particles and we're transferring them to our geometry and we're saying after the fact that the uv and the rest are equal which will make more sense when we can visualize it i promise <laughs> and then after that we drop down an attribute promote node and we target uv and we're going to make sure we promote it from a point because again, we're taking it from point data and we're going to promote it to vertex. Make sure you don't promote this to primitive like I did at first, because you'll see no changes. Make sure it's vertex. And then if we uh, look at the info on this, we can see that we have one vertex um, attribute named a UV. And then last thing we do is drop down a UV quick shade. And if you highlight that, you can now see that we have UVs that deform with our fluid. Now, yours is likely not going to look like this, and we are going to backtrack and show you exactly why. So with the UV quick shade still um, with the display flag on it, so we can see the changes, we're going to come back up to the top of this tree here. Your UVs will likely look like a jaggedy mess, looking more like this, um, very squiggly. <laughs> the reason for that is simply because the sample count for your conditions here, the max sample count, is too low. So the max this goes to by default is 10, which is not really great either. Um, but we can increase this with very minimal loss in performance. So I'm going to bump this to 100. And already you can see, now we're starting to see the UV squares, but they are looking um, very jagged, which is not what we want. We want some smoother ones. So I've just decided to leave it on 200 because I quite like the way the UVs move there. But again, depending on your simulation, you're going to have to adjust this as uh, you need. And if you have a way higher res sim, I'd probably pump this up and see how it looks then. But again, use your best judgment. And then after that, we can actually, if we bypass the attribute wrangle using the yellow display flag, this down yellow arrow, which will bypass it in the tree, pretend like it's not there. You can actually see the exact reason we use the via UV equals rest because without it, it does not deform it. Um, 
exactly how we want. If this is what you're looking for, then, you know, go ahead. That's the look you've got. But if you want actual deformation, then we're going to go ahead and need that. So we can deform it from the rest point, which is this right here. And again, like I said, if you don't have it set to uh, vertex, you'll get the same effect. So make sure that that is set to promote it to vertex on the attribute promote. And in essence, that is how you get UVs onto your fluid in Houdini. But now we need to move this out to Blender, like I promised, and add some texture to it, which is a very simple step. So what I'm going to do here is drop down a ROP Alembic output, because we're going to export this as an Alembic. We're going to make sure that this is set to the frame range, so we get the entire uh, simulation, instead of just one, one frame, which wouldn't do us uh, much. Uh, and then I am going to choose a place for this. So I'm going to put it in my tutorial. I'm going to put it as tutorial alem.abc. Um, ABC just meaning Alembic file, so that it saves properly. Uh, you don't need to add a dollar sign F uh, for Blender to recognize an Alembic sequence. I'm not too sure about Cinema 4D or Maya, um, but I'm sure you guys will know about that if you use those programs. And I'm going to leave all the other settings the same, and I'm just going to click Save to Disk. Now we're in Blender. I'm going to go ahead and press File, Import Alembic ABC here. I'm going to go to my location, which I have copy pasted to the clipboard. I'm going to select tutorial lm.abc um, and make sure all my settings are good. And I'm going to press import lmbic. I'm going to go ahead and press play, make sure it all works. As you can see, works flawlessly. Imports, plays, all fine from one file. No sequence needed. We are going to go ahead and texture this. So I'm actually going to use this main window as my render view, which I don't normally do, but that's fine. And we're going to go ahead and add a texture to it. So let's do this marble texture I have here. And as you can see, it deforms the texture exactly as we need. We can probably actually just do this in material preview mode so you guys don't have to see the noise. There we go. Much quicker viewport. So as you can see, we have everything deforming with the texture uh, spreading out. It kind of looks like some very thick uh, oil paint or perhaps uh, runny ac acrylic paint. Um, and you can swap this out for anything. Just make sure that when you're in Blender, whatever texture you apply, uses the UV texture coordinates. Otherwise, you are going to get something from perhaps generated, which will look something like this, which is exactly what we wanted to avoid. This is what it would look like if you you had no UVs, deforming UVs on your fluid. Um, same with, with normal, um, which has an interesting look to it. But if that's not what you want, you know, we generate the UVs for a reason. So make sure you're using UV into the vector mapping from your texture coordinate node. Otherwise, you'll be disappointed um, with your result. And this works with many textures. Let's just try this lapis lazuli, or lapis lazuli, as I've heard it's meant to be pronounced. And again, we're getting the same thing, um, even with this iridescent oil texture. Uh, this one is procedural, so this one is actually probably not using <laughs> uh, UV. Yes, that's what I expected. Let's change that to UV. Uh, and there you have it. This one probably looks better in a rendered view. Uh, maybe I want to increase the roughness on that. There we go. Go back to texture view. And there we go. You can see we have an oil texture on this very viscous uh, fluid that we've, we've simulated here, which is exactly what we wanted. And that's it for the tutorial. It's a very simple effect that I likely could have covered in less than a minute, but I wanted to go into a bit more detail for some of the nodes and explain why we're doing certain things, such as the small amount of vex we used just so you understand why we do the things we do anyway as always thank you guys for your attention if you have any questions please leave them in the comments or message me on twitter or email me and i'll be sure to get back to you as soon as i can take care guys